Number 1. On Friday, June 17, 2011, George Penka, 30, went hiking at the Upper Yosemite Falls in Yosemite National Park. George was from Hawthorne in California and was visiting the National Park with his church group of 80 people, of which around 20 people were walking the Upper Yosemite Fall Trail that day. The group separated at the top, with the hikers going back down at their own pace. George likely fell behind the main group. Penka's friends assume he'd hiked back to the Yosemite Valley floor earlier and didn't report him missing until 9 p.m., George has vanished off the trail. He was 5'10 tall, weighed 240 pounds, and had dark brown hair, blue eyes, a stocky build. He was last seen wearing gray sweepants with white stripes, a black t-shirt that says D and B across the chest, or a black tank top, and gray-blue running shoes. He was carrying a blue cloth bag and some limited food and water. The NPS website describes it as follows one of Yosemite's oldest historic trails, built 1873 to 1877. The Yosemite Falls Trail leads to the top of North America's tallest waterfall, which rises 2,425 feet 739 meters, above the valley floor. This trail starts near Camp 4, along the Valley Loop Trail, and immediately begins its climb, switchback after switchback, through Oak Woodland. You will begin to climb above some trees and into exposed plateaus that offer you a glimpse of what's to come. Great views of Yosemite Valley and its many iconic landforms. Do not stray off of the maintained path, as you will find steep drops adjacent to the trail. The upper half of the trail is steep and rocky, but the arduous climb is well worth the amazing views you will be rewarded with at the top. Initial search efforts began on Friday night after he was reported missing, and a full-scale search and rescue operation was initiated on Saturday morning, June 18. Around 105 search and rescue personnel from around the state were deployed, helicopters and six search dogs, including Yosemite National Park Search and Rescue, Inyo County, Mono County, Mariposa County, Marin County, Fresno County, Tulum County China Lake, Los Angeles County Nevada County, Sierra Madre, Yosemite Search and Rescue Dog Teams, Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, and California Explorer Search and Rescue. Weather conditions over the weekend were mild, with overnight temperatures in the upper 40s. On June 23, search efforts transitioned to a limited continuous search. After nearly one week of extensive searching, park rangers did not find any clues as to George's whereabouts. In the last six and a half years no trace of George Penka has been found. His bag, clothes or bones have never been located. A very strange disappearance. In 2020, there is still no information as to what may have happened to Penka. His remains, clothing, and bag have never been located. Number 2 Although she is legally blind and can hardly see, Carla Valpias loves to travel the world independently. She likes to prove that she cannot be defined by her disability. Her main reason for traveling, though, is to see as much of the world as she can before her eyesight totally disappears. She was diagnosed at age 10 with cone rod dystrophy, a condition that causes a person's vision to deteriorate over time. According to CNN, by December 2018, Carla had traveled to about 20 countries by herself. She had studied Arabic in Egypt, worked with abandoned children in Yemen, and traveled to remote villages in Indonesia to advocate for indigenous women. Her family said she had always dreamed of visiting Peru, but she hadn't yet had the chance. When Carla heard that her friend Alicia was intending to travel to Lima to take part in a wedding, she jumped at the chance to tag along with her. Carla bought an outfit for the wedding, and she set off with her friend in December 2018. Carla spent the last part of their vacation by herself, hiking Machu Picchu. Even though Alicia advised her not to go alone, Carla set off. There was a window of panic, where nobody could get in touch with her. Finally, after 12 hours of silence, Carla replied. She said the Wi-Fi was terrible, but that she was fine. There was one strange text to Alicia, I had a big issue, that I need to resolve, that I'll do it, before I get home, Carla wrote. Alicia last heard from Carla on December 11, 2018 via text, where Carla spoke of her travels I can't wait to tell you all about it. It was absolutely worth 100%. After that, her family did not hear from Carla for a few days. They did not panic until she missed her flight back home. CCTV shows Carla leaving the hostel, where she was staying in a cab, in the early morning hours of December 12. She hadn't told any of her new traveling companions where she was going. She left behind her belongings, including medicines, in the hostel, so it is assumed she always intended to return. Later police would learn that she had taken two cabs. 
The first driver dropped Carlo off at a Cusco street, where people ride shared taxis headed to the Sacred Valley. The other driver said Carlo was in his collective taxi and that she got off in the valley's first village, Pisac. A camera outside a drugstore in Pisac captured the last known image of Carla. It shows her walking quickly with her silver folding cane for 14 seconds. This was about an hour after she left her hostel. She was heading in the direction of the Pisac Archaeological Park, a 9,063 hectare, 22,395 acre, mountainside historic site known for its Incan ruins, tunnels, and massive agricultural terraces. No sign of Carla has been seen since. None of her belongings have been found. Carla's family have searched tirelessly for her since they heard of her disappearance. Peruvian police first pursued the idea that something happened to Carla in the park in Pisac. They used drones and cadaver dogs and found nothing. A team of Peruvian police detectives are currently working together to find Carla, along with a special prosecutor and they now believe that Carla never made it into the park. They believe someone took or lured her to one of the many ritual sites in the region, where tourists try an intensely hallucinogenic, and sometimes deadly, potion known as ayahuasca. Carla's family disputes that she would have wanted to take drugs. They believe Carla was sexually assaulted, kidnapped or was the victim of either human or organ trafficking. I have no doubt in my mind that my sister was the victim of a crime, her brother said. There are other tourists that have been reported missing in the area. Two men were arrested a few weeks after 28-year-old Nathalie Salazar Ayala went missing. They claimed she had died in a zipline accident and that they dumped her body in a river, yet her body has never been located. Jesse Galganov disappeared while backpacking in the Peruvian mountains in 2017. So, what happened to Carla? Did her failing vision cause her to become injured in an accident and have her remains not been found? Did she attend an ayahuasca ceremony and people are covering up her death from that? Or was she involved in foul play? Number 3. Family members are asking for the public's help in locating a 22-year-old UC Irvine student last seen walking near the Golden Gate Bridge Tunnel on Black Friday. Gavin Cusi Octaviano, an alumnus of St. Ignatius College Preparatory in San Francisco, traveled to San Francisco on November 21 to spend Thanksgiving with his family and celebrate his birthday. On November 23, surveillance cameras captured him parking a family member's 2008 Mercedes-Benz C300 in the northern Golden Gate Bridge parking lot at 5.20 p.m., according to a statement from his family. Roughly four hours later at 9.30 p.m., a motorist nearly hit Octaviano, who had been stumbling on foot near the Golden Gate Tunnel and seemed intoxicated according the involved driver, who contacted the family after seeing a missing persons poster with Octaviano's photograph on November 28. Whether Gavin was intoxicated, tired or in a dark state of mind, Gavin has no known mental disorder diagnosis we are thinking he parked his car, needed to clear his mind, started to walk, and just kept walking read a family statement. We are keeping hope alive and have faith that Gavin is still out there, somewhere wandering. Family members have spent the past several days weaving through trails on both ends of the bridge and posting flyers at local businesses in hopes of learning information that could lead to finding him. He is described by family as being 5'11 and 175 pounds. Octaviano was last seen wearing a gray North Face hoodie, a black and blue plaid shirt, dark blue jeans, and black and white Nike free sneakers. Anyone with information regarding Octaviano should call 415-672-8929 or contact the San Francisco and Daly City Police Departments. Number 4. One year ago, one of the richest Germans disappeared without a trace. Former Tengelmann CEO Karl Erevin Hobb did not return on 7 April 2018 from a ski tour in the Vallis Alps. Despite a large-scale search operation, every trace of the entrepreneur is still missing today, which together with his brothers include the textile discount store Kick and the D-Chain Ovi. And it is questionable if his corpse is ever found. One can never give up hope, but a coincidence would have to come to the rescue. Otherwise it's like finding the needle in a haystack, says Zermatt's rescue chief, Anjan Truffer, a year after his disappearance. Hobb was a well-trained athlete. He wanted to prepare for one of the most demanding touring ski competitions in the Alps in Zermatt. The Patruil des Glaciers races 53 kilometers from Zermatt through the Vallis Alps. Contrary to all recommendations of the mountain guides, the entrepreneur was traveling alone on the Klein Matterhorn near Zermatt. He was last seen at the mountain station of the gondola lift at more than 3,800 meters altitude. His disappearance did not occur until he did not return to the hotel in the evening. 
In the meantime, there is no active search for the body of Karl Erevan Holb. If he falls into a crevasse, the chance of finding him is very low, you have to be realistic, says Truffer. There are thousands of crevices up there. You can fall 20, 30 meters deep into a crevasse, sometimes more. The collapsing snow bridge, which covered the crevasse, can weigh several tons and often crashes on the person. But the entrepreneur has not yet been declared dead. A similar procedure could be initiated by the family at the earliest one year after the disappearance. But no one wants to urge relatives to do so in the emotional time immediately after the anniversary. It is clear anyway that the shares in the company go to the two children of Karl Erevan Hobb. This is what the statute of the family wants. Hobb's disappearance was not only a grave inconvenience for his family, but also for Tengelman. For around 15 years, Karl Erevan Hobb had left his mark on the trading empire. His younger brother Christian Hobb jumped into the gap he left behind. The entrepreneur used to live with his family in the USA, but plans to relocate to Germany later this year. Just one and a half weeks after the disappearance of his brother Christian Hobb took over the sole management of the family empire. Previously, he had been in charge of managing the family fortune and the family's charitable activities. In addition, he led the family-owned venture capital company Emil Capital Partners. After assuming office, he first tried to dispel the fears of the future in the company. The loss of our brother is a tragedy for our family. But it does not endanger the continued existence of our family business, he emphasized. Not least thanks to his brother, the Tengelman Group was solid and fit for the future. Christian Hobb now has the helm firmly in his hands and continues the restructuring of the family empire initiated by his brother with the sale of the food trade. He does not hesitate to cut off old braids. So he announced in January a drastic reduction of the group holding company. In the process, most of the previously 250 jobs are to be eliminated. In view of the company sales in recent years, such as the sale of Kaiser's Tengelman supermarkets, the previous holding was oversized. The downsizing of the corporate headquarters is also symbolically a turning point. Because this is the task of the traditional company headquarters in Mulheim and Durer. But Christian Hobb feels more committed to the future than to the past anyway, and is sure that he will meet the wishes of his missing brother. The common goal has always been to hand over the family business in good condition to the next generation, he said, when he succeeded Karl Erevan Hobb. I hold fast to this goal, and I will do everything in my power to achieve it. There are some things to inherit. According to estimates by the manager magazine, the entrepreneurial dynasty, with a fortune of around 5 billion euros, is still one of the richest German families. Number 5 on Friday, June 17, 2016, Floyd Roberts III, 52, set out for a hike together with friend Ned Bryant and Ned's daughter Madeline Bryant for a trip to the western part of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. That fateful backpacking adventure was the last time that Floyd would be seen alive. He vanished into thin air after deciding to climb a hill using a different route to the Bryants in the Grand Canyon Parishant National Monument. The two friends met when they were about 10 years old in Princeton, New Jersey, and Roberts was the best man at the wedding of Nett and Heidi Bryant. Floyd went on to live in Huntsville, Alabama, where he worked for NASA, and from there he went on to teach computer programming and game design at Middleton High School in Treasure Island, Florida. The friends first started hiking in the area in 1992, and sometimes Bryant would go on his own, but for two decades, Roberts had been his regular hiking buddy. The Bryants were board members of the Grand Canyon Hikers and Backpackers Association. Although Roberts hadn't been hiking for a few years, he was an experienced hiker. And the group had visited the area back in 2011 without incident. The group planned a nine-day hike on the Shivwitz Plateau that would exit the canyon via Separation Canyon and were intending to spend the first couple of days camped alongside the river. They anticipated they would finish their hike on June 26. Floyd was 170 pounds 5'11 tall, brown-gray hair, brown eyes, and was last seen wearing a red long-sleeved shirt, blue denim jeans, multicolored mesh Nike-free sneakers, large blue low alpine contour backpack, and white-rimmed sunglasses with orange lenses. He brought two gallons of water with him, and enough food to last a week. Before they reached the trailhead, the group reached a hill at around 4.45 p.m. They decided to take different routes. Ned Bryant and his daughter went up and over, Floyd contoured around the hill. At that point, the group separated and agreed to meet at the other side of the hill. When Ned Bryant and his daughter reached the other side of the hill, they waited for Roberts. They got anxious and started looking for him. They retraced their steps, they went back to the road. But nothing. Floyd had mysteriously vanished at that point. 
Floyd was last seen near Kelly Tanks heading towards Trail Canyon 214 Mile Canyon, Shanley Spring area, towards the river, but may have descended into 209 Mile Canyon. The area is in the extreme western portion of Grand Canyon, in an area called the Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument. Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument is a very remote and undeveloped place jointly managed by the National Park Service, NPS, and the Bureau of Land Management, BLM. The name Parashant is derived from the Paiute word Potai Asosant, meaning tanned elk hide, or softening of the elk hide. There are no paved roads into the monument and no visitor services. The area is 1,048,325 acres, 424,242 hectares. Elevation ranges from 1,230 feet, 370 meters, above sea level near Grand Wash Bay at Lake Mead, to 8,029 feet, 2,447 meters, at Mount Trumbull. Ned Bryant and his daughter decided to camp for the night and then walk to an area with cellular reception and was first able to report Roberts missing to the National Park Service on Saturday, June 18 at around 3 p.m. Temperatures in the Grand Canyon National Park were around about 92 degrees, 33.3 degrees centigrade on the afternoon when Floyd was reported missing and rising to 110 degrees on a subsequent couple of days. So it was hot, but Floyd had a reasonable supply of water. Initially, around 15 people were involved in the search, including sniffer dogs. Eventually, seven ground teams in the National Park Service NPS, helicopter were involved in a search area covering over 10 square miles and in an extremely remote rugged area of the canyon. Searchers from Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument and Mohave County helped the Grand Canyon National Park Search and Rescue Team. The NPS also worked with the Coconino County Search and Rescue. The area was rugged and covered in thick brush, and transportation to the area took several hours. A base camp had been set up near Kelly Tanks with shade shelters, water, and other resources for the search teams. After six days in the heat and tough terrain, the search was scaled back on June 24, and the authorities went into limited but continuous search mode. At that point, there were few clues about where Roberts might be. While there were footprints to follow at one point, rescuers could not confirm they belonged to him. Since that day in 2016, no trace of Floyd has been found. Disappeared off the face of the earth, despite being an experienced, well-prepared, hiker. Perhaps, just a case of hyperthermia in the 100 degrees plus heat and a stumble in the wilderness. Number 6 A national volunteer group is renewing efforts to find missing Niagara Falls man Ben Trommels nearly four years after he vanished. Please bring me home. A group founded in Owen Sound two years ago wants to build interest in Trommels again in the hopes an anonymous tip can finally bring closure to his family. Once these cases go out of the public eye and the police's trail goes dry, it's out of sight, out of mind, said group spokeswoman Courtney Howlett. By bringing this back into the public's eye, we are able to find these people just by putting it out there. 24-year-old Ben Trommels lived alone in an apartment in the north end of Niagara Falls, Ontario, in 2016. The young man was troubled and had been struggling with mental health issues for at least three years at that point. On February 11, 2016, Ben went grocery shopping with his mother. While they were talking, Ben said something that would haunt his mother for years to come. As they were walking in the store, Ben said, I'm tired of it all. This occurred after conversations in which Ben had declared that he wanted to jump down the falls and never be found as he felt that he was a burden to his mother. His mother, Monique Smith, said feared he had taken his own life. But he could still be out there, she said in an interview a month after his disappearance. I don't know, but I can't rule anything out right now. Howlett said Trommel's family contacted Please Bring Me Home last year. Since forming, the group has located 16 missing persons, 13 of them still alive. Among its volunteers are former law enforcement, private investigators, criminologists, and search and rescue experts. The group solicits anonymous tips by putting missing persons' faces and stories back on social media. Often, these tips come from people who won't, for various reasons, go to the police. A lot of people know stuff, but they don't want to talk to the police, said Howlett. Some people don't like police officers, some people have had bad dealings with law enforcement, or they're too afraid. Or they don't want to get involved. The group shares its information with police, while keeping tipsters anonymous. After being profiled on an episode of the CTV show W5 last fall, the group went from Ontario-only searches to nationwide. It is currently working on 26 cases across Canada. 
After Trommel's 2016 disappearance, several hundred people searched Fireman's Park, and a police dive team searched a large pond on site. A helicopter search of the Niagara Gorge also turned up nothing. Trommel's is described as 5 foot 10, about 170 pounds, with hazel eyes and a shaved head. He was last seen wearing jeans, a black bomber-style jacket and a blue hoodie. He may have also been wearing pink earbuds. Number 7 Two years, a $400,000 search and now a coroner's grim death declaration have passed since 25-year-old Prabdeep Sron vanished in the vast expanses of the snowy mountains, but his family still refuses to believe the university student is dead. Ultimately the peaks of Kosciusko National Park hold the answer to what happened to the Canadian Army reservist who was studying at Bond University on the Gold Coast. Since he disappeared on a routine 2013 hike, his family has spent $400,000 on private searches, but the windswept, snow-covered mountains still have not given him up. It was the biggest search in Mount Kosciusko National Park since the disappearance of four snowboarders in August 1999. Their remains weren't discovered until that spring when the snow melted and their bodies were found in a snow cave. The coroner yesterday declared Mr. Sron dead. However, in a statement to NSW coroner's court last month, his family said it remained its belief and conviction is that Prab is right there miracles do happen. Coroner Harriet Graham determined Mr. Sron died on or in the days shortly after May 14, 2013, while walking in the National Park. As he parked his rental van at Charlotte Pass on what was initially a sunny day, he most likely had every reason to feel confident and prepared for his day hike to Australia's highest peak. He had used his laptop to search Google Maps and Wikipedia to plot out the trek, which would take him the reverse way along the main range walking track to Mount Kosciusko. Mr. Sron tucked his laptop under a car seat, pulled on the jacket he had just purchased at Jindabyne and set off on the nine-hour walk, oblivious to the fact that the weather was about to turn unexpectedly bitter. The last sign of him being alive that day were the footprints a fellow hiker saw imprinted in the snow. However, it was four days later that a staff member at the resort noticed a van with a 24-hour park entry pass on the windscreen, dated for the previous Monday. It was another two days before police tracked Mr. Sron's identity through the vehicle rental company. By that time Mr. Sron would have been drenched by 30 millimeters of rain, 30 millimeters of snow, and have been exposed to night temperatures as low as minus 4.8 C. Mr. Sron's parents, Major and Devinder Sron, his sister Mandeep, and his cousin Raj, arrived at Charlotte Pass from Brampton, Ontario. Using the last evidence from his laptop, up to 40 people at a time looked for Mr. Sron in the next four weeks. The search included three helicopters equipped with infrared sensors, police dog squads and alpine rescuers. Survival expert Dr. Paul Luckin said Mr. Sron could have survived 14 days at best, but probably died before then, succumbing to hypothermia caused by exposure to very low temperatures, wind and snow. Ms. Graham found all available evidence pointed to a tragic encounter with weather and rugged terrain. While heartbreaking for his family, I am satisfied that Prab has perished somewhere in the Kosciusko National Park. While his body has never been located, I am of the view that it is comfortably established that Prabdeep Sron is indeed dead. Ms. Graham recommended national parks and wildlife and police immediately investigate and consider setting up an online system where bushwalkers can lodge their intended trips 